Hello, and welcome to this Smith's Interconnect webinar. My name is Katie, and I will be your Global Spec moderator. So now let me introduce today's presenter and go over our agenda. With us today, we have Tim Wooden. Tim is a market development director of the semiconductor test area with Smith's Interconnect. So today's kind of agenda or goals, uh, the first to understand current technological trends in generative AI. Then we're gonna explore the transition to 224 gigabits for a PAM-4 transition lines. We'll then discuss specific hardware deployments needed to realize the full potential of these next generation AI chips. We will also discover some of Smith's Interconnect's product offerings, and then we will have an open discussion or what we like to call our Q&A session. So with that, I am gonna pass things over to Tim to get this webinar started. So Tim, go right ahead. Thank you, Katie. Uh, good morning, good evening, good or good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everybody that has decided to uh, attend this webinar. Uh, we are going to make a few bold statements here uh, in the opening. I guess my question to you at the end of this presentation will be, did I use generative AI to create and present the presentation, or am I really me? Uh, let's move into it. I, I think we all know and understand um, the trend and tag words around artificial intelligence, machine learning, and, um, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, edge computing. We are on the the edge of the greatest technology shift since the emergence of the internet and the impact and value of generative artificial intelligence is difficult to accurately measure uh, since AI has the potential to fundamentally change the industries that we participate and work in from automotive uh, to scientific research uh, and even medical treatment. Uh, next generation data center hardware is required to ensure that we realize the full potential of advanced AI semiconductor devices. Uh, and some of the reason is that we need to move the absolute most amount of data uh, with the short and late, shortest latency uh, in the quickest amount of time. Uh, the transition to 224 gigabit PAM 4, 6, 8, 16 uh, transmission lines are paramount to achieving uh, this success. Uh, one of the things that cannot be neglected in these next generation systems is power integrity, and power integrity needs to be optimized through the electromechanical interconnect. Thermal design power. Uh, for these next generation devices is targeted to be around 1400 watts, uh, which is a new level of thermal management will be required to uh, help address these powers. Uh, some fun facts, the amount of data created and captured, copied and consumed worldwide is expected to grow from a hundred, or I'm sorry, 59 zettabytes in 2020 to around 149 zettabytes in 2024. Uh, and just for reference, one zettabyte is one six trillion bytes. Uh, that is 21 zeros, a little bit larger than what my paycheck is, but we're getting there. Uh, technology drivers and what is driving these different segments. Uh, move to cloud. Nearly all data is currently backed up in a cloud or being run from a cloud. Uh, companies are hosting their own public cloud services with hyperscalers rather than provide or have to maintain their own data centers internally. Uh, edge computing. Uh, edge computing is the IoT, online gaming, uh, 5G connectivity, uh, ADAS or advanced driver uh, assistance and safety, 
applications uh, which are requiring more bandwidth uh, on the network. Machine learning applications are being deployed on a wide range of IoT devices such as smart home security access um, control systems. The benefits of machine learning include lower latency, increased energy efficiency, and enhanced security and privacy. From a data center perspective, I have data center here, but data centers actually represent the largest and most vulnerable areas of exposure to sophisticated threats. Uh, protecting this information is a real-time defensive with advanced security features evolving daily and deploying AI to help prevent and stay ahead of some of these vulnerabilities uh, is also critical to protecting it. And reducing power of data centers. Data centers currently have one of the largest carbon footprints on the planet at 200 terawatt hours uh, in 2020, which was nearly 1% of the global electricity demand. Some of the world's largest data centers require more than 100 megawatts of power to operate. Uh, that's uh, enough for 80,000 homes here in the U.S. And reducing the required power to compute more data is the quickest way to achieve the global initiative uh, to our net zero carbon footprint, as that is a goal and target um, KPI for most companies today. A uh, little, a few more fun facts, artificial intelligence in the, in the high performance compute, compute space. Um, to realize the full potential of generative AI, advanced hardware infrastructure capable of connecting thousand GP, thousands of GPUs in parallel, um, within server clusters, allow them to work together for the most efficient training possible. Each of these servers is what's considered a high performance compute cluster. And I will show a diagram on a few slides as to what constitutes a cluster, uh, but are paramount to the successful implementation and training of LLM or lar large language models. Uh, for reference, Chet GPT uh, is probably one of the most well-known uh, consumer and uh, consumer professional generative AI uh, applications right now. Chet GPT-2 um, was released, and it was capable of computing 1.5 billion parameters. Uh, and to train that model, uh, OpenAI used 16 RTX 2090 graphics cards, uh, which were NVIDIA's high-end graphics card. Uh, and to train the model cost about $100,000. For Chet GPT-4, um, the number of parameters is actually not specified, uh, but the best guess is it's over $250 billion parameters. Uh, the number of GPUs used to train that model were 10,000 GA100 graphics cards, uh, and the cost to train Chet GPT-4 uh, was 63 million U.S. dollars. So as you can see, as the AI gets more complex, um, next generation hardware is required to get these products to market, but there's also a cost associated with it. Um, so how do we compute more data? Uh, CERTES, CERTES is a uh, type of signaling that's been around for quite some time. Uh, it's always been used on the high speed end of uh, the semiconductor market. Um, it is circuitry that's designed uh, that converts parallel data into a serialized form uh, that's strictly for transmission over a physical medium. 
such as copper or optical fiber, then converts it back to the parallel data at the receiving end. Uh, so it allows you to send more data uh, down a signal path that uh, at a faster rate of speed. Uh, in high data, high speed data transmission, it becomes difficult to maintain signal integrity and achieve reliable data transfer just due to factors like noise, uh, interference, and signal degradation, depending upon the length of the transmission line. Uh, the SODES technology has addressed these challenges for many years uh, and will continue to address, address them into the future, implementing advanced signal processing techniques and equaliz equalization algorithms to compensate for losses and distortions in the transmission media. Excuse me. Uh, CERTES involves parallel to serial conversion of data at the transmitter end. And by using the CERTES high-speed data transmission, it can, be it can be achieved without requiring excessive number of interconnect lines. Uh, and this reduces complexity, power consumption, and cost associated with the interconnect design of the IC and also the system. Uh, the CERTES technology enables efficient utilization of available bandwidth, enabling faster and more reliable data communication between devices, servers, networks, and systems. And this is just a overview of the CERTES line and how it computes the data from uh, the transceiver to the receiver. Uh, next generation GPU AI or machine learning cluster. Uh, this is an example of next generation uh, AI machine learning clusters. And the reason that I wanted to give an overview as to the breakout of the clusters is where is or where are these 224 gigabit PAM4 interconnects being required? Um, because we are still limited in some other system building protocols um, by speed. And uh, in the server block diagram on the left, you can see what is an example of a next generation cluster. It has uh, the memory at the top, multiple CPUs, uh, accelerators, uh, added to the system and then the GPUs that run in parallel. Uh, you could see the GPUs in the chip to chip portion are what are requiring the 224 gigabit PAM4. Uh, the GPU to the system still runs at PCIe Gen 6, although SXM and OAM is increasing that. Uh, and then we have new protocol CXL 2.0, uh, currently working on 3.0, which also runs at 64 gigabits uh, per second PAM4. And what constitute a data center uh, equal or greater than 256 nodes, uh, this server diagram here on the right is what would be considered a node or a server blade. Uh, what constitutes a cluster is greater than two data centers. Uh, some of the accelerator terminology, it, it's referred to as the acronym NIC or accelerator is just being used openly now, but NIC is a network interface card and this helps pick up uh, computational power for these large language models, uh, depending upon the application. Uh, the chip-to-chip -chip communication, as I went over earlier, uh, is what is driving next generation speeds. Uh, and each of the big manufacturers have their own proprietary chip-to-chip -chip communication. Uh, 
Um, NVLink is proprietary to NVIDIA. XGMI is proprietary to AMD. Uh, Z-Link is proprietary to Intel. Uh, and this allows for each one of these GPUs to run up to 16 GPUs per switch at 224 gigabits per uh, PAM4. So each one of these is capable of creating these these large parallel clusters to uh, train these models. Challenges of the 224 gigabit PAM4. Uh, this is still unknown. We, we have been testing a few devices sub 200 gigabits, uh, but as these devices come out, we're having to work quite a bit closer in understanding what the challenges really are going to be implemented in um, the final product from a signal integrity perspective. Uh, the impact of channel losses, reflections, and crosstalk on the high-speed signal integrity is why accurate modeling and simulation of the channels is needed. Uh, equalization techniques to compensate for channel impairments in the system is incredibly important uh, as the weakest link in the system uh, will typically cause failure. Uh, noise and jitter and understanding the noise and jitter limits and the impact on the signal integrity or the signal quality at the highest speed. Um, defining the source of noise and jitter in the CERTES IC is critical. Uh, as a socket solution provider, uh, we diligently focus on these techniques uh, to ensure that we properly address crosstalk, uh, and we do that using HFS S simulation uh, to evaluate the full design prior to manufacturing of the test socket. And we have to do this on a project-by-project -project basis uh, since each customer's IC is so unique with different uh, I.O. counts and location, pattern of the high-speed signals uh, within the array. And it, it is why we're doing this on every single project that comes across. And power integrity. Power integrity we've been talking about for quite a few years now as we went into uh, 112 gigabit PAM4, uh, but much more now on the 224 gigabit PAM4. Uh, any neglect of power delivery uh, can severely affect the performance of the CERTES IC. Uh, the challenge in voltage drops across the system array or the socket array will result in unacceptable bit error rates, or BER is an acronym that is often. Uh, published in connection with uh, these results. And this is just due to pulse amplitude modulation, or PAM, uh, requiring multiple levels of voltages to ensure that each bit of data is successfully transmitted. The challenges related to power integrity, uh, such as decoupling power distribution network, or PDN design um, and power delivery network impedance. This all needs to be simulated as, uh, full, as a full system to ensure that uh, we are not exposing the IC or the system to voltage drops across the array. Uh, continuing on some of the challenges and a lot of the still lies in the path to 224 gigabits. It starts with the ability to characterize the product at a component level and to test each of the devices, a uh, high-speed electrical signal generator with the ability to adjust amplitude voltages, uh, modulation format, and to de-emphasize device packaging and transmission line parasitic to compensate for device packaging and transmission line bandwidth 
And where we're running into issues in this space is that there are a few, there, there is some equipment available to use to, to test these uh, theories, but uh, it, it's just not readily available yet. Uh, below, I've highlighted a key site, which is an M8. 050A. Uh, this is capable of a 120 gigabaud uh, BERT pattern generator, and it is capable of generating both real time and memory based patterns in NRZ, PAM4, PAM6, PAM8 uh, from 2 to 120 gigabits per second. Uh, but it, it's just not uh, something that's readily available, available uh, across the market so as we are designing and running simulations for these critical speeds um, a lot of it is still based on theory and we are working closer than ever with our customers to um, make small adjustments that will get the end result the customers looking for uh, one area I just wanted to highlight uh, was just the difference between the PAM4, PAM6, PAM8, uh, PAM16 uh, signaling formats. Uh, if we look at 112 gigabit per second PAM4, uh, the bits per symbol per clock cycle is 2 bits per clock cycle. Uh, signaling rate is 56 gigabyte. The Unit interval is 17.86 picoseconds, and fundamental frequency driving that clock cycle is 28 gigahertz, and the signal to noise ratio at the slicer is 20.4 to dB, uh, and you have no signal to noise ratio penalty. Uh, if we go to 224 gigabit PAM4, uh, we are also receiving two bits per clock cycle. Uh, the signaling rate is 112 gigabaud. Uh, the unit interval time though drops significantly to 8.93 picoseconds. Fundamental frequency is double to 56 gigahertz. Uh, and the SNR is the same as 112 gigabit. But as we move up to, for instance, 16, uh, we can get four bits per clock cycle. Uh, our signaling rate is still 56 gigabaud. Uh, our unit interval is the same as 112 gigabaud at 17.86 picoseconds. Fundamental frequency is also dropped to the same as 112 at 28 gigahertz, uh, but the SNR uh, creeps up to 32.55, uh, where it really is a challenge is in the SNR penalty, the signal to noise ratio, uh, you have 12.12 .12 dB uh, penalty. So as we go up in the different modulate or different modulations, uh, there is a cause and effect related to uh, each spec and uh, the trade-offs need to be uh, evaluated. From the Smith Interconnect perspective from the semi-test group and where we're focused, our focus is on delivering an IC test socket to that is capable of testing these next generation challenges. Uh, this is where our DaVinci product line has for uh, multiple years been the market leader in this area and there is a few reasons why that is. Uh, we address the four main critical path requirements to ensure that a test socket does not become the bottleneck in achieving next generation bandwidth um, and the areas that we focus are, are on the IR drop. Um, just quickly to reference uh, the Da Vinci socket here uh, would go in between the white box here. Uh, this is an example of a, a next generation device 
mounted to a uh, PCB. Uh, our our focus is IR drop uh, across the array, uh, not actually up here. We're we're more focused on uh, IC to PCB, not uh, component to substrate. Uh, crosstalk noise, crosstalk noise, the the same caution and uh, white glove approach that's taken from a uh, wafer design to substrate is taken with the test socket portion. Uh, power supply induced voltage noise. Uh, traditionally, this has not been a huge um, issue for us. If we're able to address the power on the front side, this, this has been less of an, an issue, but as we get into these higher data rates and more switching at shorter uh, rise and fall times of the clock cycle, this is has the potential to be a, a larger challenge. Uh, and then uh, signal degradation. Uh, using a coaxial structure, we're able to uh, address these four challenges uh, and by simulating the information prior to delivery, uh, our customers and uh, the Smith team have confidence in the product that we are delivering is going to meet your requirement. Uh, this is just an overview of COWOS, which is uh, an Another acronym, you know, in the semiconductor industry, we love acronyms. I think we have our own acronym uh, dictionary. Uh, but COWOS is chip on wafer on substrate. And the advantage of the chip on wafer on substrate is that you can use multiple uh, different die or chiplets and the real benefit of this structure is that you can stack memory on the substrate. So HBM memory, high bandwidth memory, um, memory has always been the biggest struggle in uh, these performance GPUs. Uh, they are memory hogs. So with the ability to stack multiple layers of memory on the substrate, you are able to get more memory to the GPU or the computational core uh, quicker. So that is an overview of the COWOS. Uh, another thing that we're starting to see besides the chiplet trans, uh, transition is uh, using a GPU die for different in packages is because of the chiplet structure where a GPU manufacturer used to produce one GPU and from that one GPU they would create multiple SKUs that ended up in multiple different products but say a gaming uh, a gaming GPU for consumer and a professional grade uh, GPU for a CAD designer they may be the same core GPU chip, um, but with different fuses blown and a, a, a few different changes, but still the same same GPU. Uh, now we're seeing where the GPU, uh, where it used to be, this was a high performance compute and uh, day, or ML machine learning uh, GPU. Now they are using that same GPU but applying different HBM uh, and some other cores in the chiplet design to make it a GPU just for high performance compute. And for the machine learning GPU, you can see they use the same GPU module, uh, but then they increase uh, the, the memory cache, uh, add more memory, and then they could add other IOs uh, for Tensor or uh, anything else needed. So we're starting to see this transition as well. Uh, now we're going to get to 
some of the stuff that we're doing internally. I'm just going to use an actual working example of of a project we're currently working on. Um, our customer came to us with a 224 gigabit uh, PAM4 requirement, and uh, which was running 56 gigahertz fundamental frequency. Uh, the ball pitch was one millimeter. Uh, from a ILRL perspective, that that is not too much of a concern in a coaxial type socket. Um, but where the challenge comes in is in the crosstalk and the noise generated by uh, the power of the ground plane or uh, signal to signal crosstalk. This was the original pattern given to us by a customer. Um, you could see the differential pairs are here in pink. Uh, there was actually, it says no pin, but there, there was physically no pin uh, in the red. Um, so I, I will show you the results of these two patterns uh, on the next couple slides. But um, then after some back and forth, running some simulations and interacting with the customer, to try and achieve their crosstalk uh, results. Uh, we ended up with this pattern, um, which as you can see, we've added significantly more ground around uh, the differential pair to help accommodate their crosstalk patterns, which I will show you here in a second. Uh, so both pattern A and pattern B from a return loss perspective, uh, you could see was was quite good at 96.4 gigahertz at minus 10 dB uh, for the pattern A. Uh, for the pattern B, what we actually picked up about two gigahertz uh, at minus 10 dB. From an IL perspective, we picked up about 10 gigahertz uh, on pattern B, and Again, not a drastic difference in the results as our target frequency was 56 gigahertz. So uh, little impact from, from either of the IL or RL perspective. Uh, this is where the challenge really pops up, which is the crosstalk requirement. A uh, customer also gave us a crosstalk requirement for next and fixed. Uh, next is near in crosstalk, and that would be on the PCB side of the board and the bottom of the socket, and vexed far in crosstalk, which is on the bottom of the device on the top side of the socket. Uh, so for pattern A, you could see uh, from for next for the near in crosstalk we were able to achieve 18.5 gigahertz at minus 32 dB. Uh, for the FEX, the far end crosstalk, we were able to achieve 15.8 gigahertz at minus, minus 26 dB. Again, this was that pattern A, uh, which had the dif differential pair, uh, although it did have ground around the pair, there were still some open positions where there was no pins. Um, after going uh, back and forth with simulations, reviewing simulations with the customer, a uh, customer agreed to add the the ground balls to the location that we uh, discussed there, and you could see the the difference was was drastic in the nearing crosstalk of 67 gigahertz at minus 46.7 dB. And our far end crosstalk improved to 63.5 gigahertz at minus 42.6 dB. And this it was a, a great example of the type of um, working collaboration needs to be done uh, on each one of these on a case by case basis. So that brings us to the conclusion. And my, my conclusion is collaboration, collaboration, and a little bit more collaboration. Uh, for 
summary, close collaboration between all parties from the IC manufacturer, socket manufacturer to the PCB manufacturer all need to be working together in the development phase. Uh, test socket from a high speed probe impedance needs to match the system impedance, not just using generic 50 ohm. I say generic, but not just using uh, rule of thumb impedances from historic points of reference. Uh, you know, there are different impedances within uh, each one of these arrays where some signaling for single ended uh, is we're being asked for for lower impedance uh, for the differential pair we're asked being asked for higher impedance and we're having to accommodate multiple impedances in the array uh, co-simulation is required prior to manufacturing of the components and the co-simulation is a full HFSS simulation of the PCB test socket uh, through the device to help understand end results. One thing you did notice me discuss in this presentation was GDDR memory. Uh, GDDR memory is still one of the most critical, um, if not more important, signaling perspective, uh, signaling uh, adjacencies that we have to address, um, if not as important as CERTES for a successful rollout of these next generation devices, but we are and have been constantly uh, focused on GDDR7 uh, and the next generation of the GDDR memory to ensure that the, those challenges are being met. Uh, crosstalk isolation needs to be addressed throughout the design cycle, uh, as even with a coaxial interconnect, uh, the nearing crosstalk will still be impacted. Uh, this can't be overstated. I could bold this and make one slide just for this bullet. Uh, another thing I did not get into much today, um, but we're looking forward to getting into it more in the future is the thermal management side uh, that this will absolutely be a challenge with, uh, as I had pointed out earlier, the anticipated thermal design power of 1400 watts for these next generation devices. Uh, unique design features and implementations are going to be required to maintain uh, acceptable uh, test temperatures. And as we expect next generation GPUs to be the largest ICs ever produced uh, with greater than 10,000 pins and up to three to 4,000 high speed signals in a single array, uh, the challenges keep getting more immense and we are here to solve them one by one. Uh, this slide was supposed to have like a pop up where where I introduced you to Pogo. Uh, Pogo is our um, internal character that was desi designed uh, by one of our mechanical engineers. Uh, her name is Valeria. She did a great job with Pogo. And Pogo's model is when speed is what you need, uh, we have it for you. So as I... That will wrap up the webinar today. Um, I will leave it on this slide to show you the evolution of the DaVinci socket as we transition from uh, what is considered our 35G structure or the original DaVinci product released to market in 2010 to our DaVinci Next structure. Uh, which we will not be publicly displaying today, but uh, we'd be happy to to have a call with you. So thank you, everybody, for, for your time today, uh, and I look forward to discussing this topic more in the future. All right, Tim, thank you so much for that presentation. So we are going to move into our Q&A session at this time.
All right. So, Tim, we are going to go into our questions now. So let me ask this first one here. Power. Should we expect higher or more consistent current carrying demands from spring pin technology? Well, I, this is a, a great question. Um, you know, I, I am going to shamelessly plug one of my teammates here, um, Steve Carnegie, who is the product line manager for our spring probes. Uh, we absolutely should expect um, more consistent current carrying capacity from the spring probes themselves um, as we move into uh, other technologies, um, uh, other contact technologies, you know, lowering contact resistance and providing more current carrying capacity. Um, at a acceptable rise temp is is paramount to the success of uh, this type of signal. All right, thank you so much for that answer. Okay, moving to another one here. Does Smith's Interconnect have a product ready today to meet this requirement or is it just in development? Uh, great, great question. Um, I don't know if I can completely answer that um, without getting in trouble. Um, but yes, we do have a, a product uh, that can uh, meet these 224 gigabit data rates. Um, again, this is a, a, a case by case basis. I, I don't think there's a one size fits all um, solution to achieve these. Uh, these speeds, we need to uh, work with the customer um, and we need to look at the IC uh, package layout to uh, help deliver a solution for, for these speeds. Okay, thank you so much for that answer. Moving on to our next one here. As we start increasing bandwidth, as in with the case you mentioned, the 1400W will be removing dissipating heat in traditional methods be sufficient, such as via heat spreader or TCU? Oh, you guys, you guys are throwing the hard ones at me today. Um, yeah, we, we do anticipate needing to use alternative cooling techniques um, as we breach the thousand watt uh, thermal design power. Uh, there is a few ongoing projects for alternative cooling techniques, both in production and at the bench, um, where we are actually submerging uh, ICs in the IC pocket uh, with non-conductive um, fluid to a set temperature to help dissipate these large amounts of heat with great success. Uh, so that, that is something that, that we're working on uh, with uh, handler companies also uh, to help integrate into the production test environment. I hope that answered the question. All right, great, thank you so much. So we've got time for a couple more today. Just a note to grab those items from the resource widget when you have a minute today. And if you do have a last minute question or comment, feel free to enter that in now. If we don't get to it today, we will reach out to you following the webinar. All right, Tim, our next one here. Is CERTUS the biggest challenges that are faced moving this data rate? Uh, I, 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 you know, I think that that's probably going to be, uh, again, a case by case basis. I, I think Certes will probably in the end prove to be one of the easier signaling rates to, uh, accommodate in a test circuit just due to the, serial deserial capability of the signal line itself to where um, 
the more challenging signals still te- seem to be the the bit lower uh, frequency single ended channels, uh, the GDDRs, for instance, um, and even DDR5, DDR6, LP DDR5. Th- those are still uh, quite a challenge, uh, no matter what we do. So I. I'm not 100% sure they will be the most challenging to achieve 224 gigabit. All right. Thank you so much for that answer. So, Tim, we're going to take this last one today, and then we're going to start to wrap things up. As I mentioned, if you have a question in with us, we will get back to you following today's webinar. So, Tim, the last one for today, are you or someone from your team available to discuss this topic more now? (laughs) <laughs> uh you know i'm a busy guy um i'm i'm the i'm here doing webinars but i can absolutely make as much time as needed to discuss this topic with you uh or any one of our team i'm sure any one of our team can would be happy to jump on a call and discuss this topic this is a, a burning topic internally and i think that um, you know, it's something we're talking about as a group, and we look forward to talking about more uh, outside of the building walls. So the answer is absolutely send me your number, and uh, we will uh, arrange contact. All right. Thank you so much for that last answer, Tim. So we are going to start to wrap the webinar up right now. If we do have any more questions that you think of or you have anything you'd like to ask Tim, this webinar will be on demand for the next 90 days. So you will be able to come back and watch this again and ask any questions that you would like. You can also download the resources at any time during those 90 days. So, Tim, I want to say a huge thank you for being here with us today, for sharing such a great presentation and answering a few questions. Thanks so much. Thank you, Katie. One one quick question before we drop off. I if anybody wants to take a guess to whether it's really me or I created an AI version of myself, please drop it in the notes. Um, I'll be happy to, to answer your question for you. All right. Thank you so much, Tim. And anybody that wants to participate in that, uh, feel free to enter in your question or your answer into the Q&A window. Click submit. And again, you can always do that during the on-demand as well. So huge thank you to the audience members for being part of this event. Take care, and we will speak with all of you soon. Thank you, Katie.